Hey everybody, I'm Derek, and today we're going to talk about the Akai AX60. What is the Akai AX60? Well, let's start with a quick history lesson. Before the mid-80s, Akai primarily developed consumer hi-fi electronics under a handful of different brand names that varied depending on the region. They were Roberts in the US, a and in Japan, and Tensai in Western Europe. The company was best known for manufacturing cassette players, VCRs, and reel-to-reel -reel recorders that were so good just look at the effect they had on Lucille Ball. However, in 1984, Akai created the Akai Professional Division to focus exclusively on building equipment marketed to musicians. The first product they released was the MG1212. This behemoth 12-track recorder made use of VHS-like cartridges and retailed at the consumer-friendly price of holy sh**. It didn't take long before Akai set their sights on the two heavies of the synth arena at this point in time, that being of course Roland and Yamaha. During this era, Roland's Juno series of synthesizers were already recording studio mainstays and Yamaha's DX7 was redefining the synth market even though its capacity for subtlety and nuance wouldn't be fully realized until a decade later. Akai's first entry into the fray was the AX80. This 8-voice analog synth featured digitally controlled oscillators and a single, simply awesome data entry knob that allowed users to adjust parameters and view their settings via a unique fluorescent matrix that made the jump from the brand's hi-fi and VCR displays. While the AX80 is an interesting historical footnote, it didn't set the world on fire with its sound, and if that super cool fluorescent display malfunctioned, there was little hope of repair. This brings us now to the AX60. This six-voice synthesizer took aim squarely at the Juno series with its layout of sliders, each dedicated to a single parameter, and two big fat chorus options that, for the life of me, I cannot tell the difference between. The AX60 employed voltage-controlled oscillators as opposed to DCOs, offering a rough-around-the-edges sound that used the same Curtis chips that also appeared in the Sequential Circuits Max, 6-track, and split 8 synths. These keyboards of the same era generally sound pretty good, but unlike the AX60 sliders, their user interfaces made them some of Sequential's most despised instruments. Also, look at this font. What are we, pledging to a fraternity? Let's take a look at some of the features that are unique to the AX60. Whereas most other synths of the time forced you to break out the tweezers if there was a tuning issue, the AX60 also featured an onboard autotune button that, according to the manual, you should basically just keep pressing all the time whenever you remember to. Let's see how it works. Ooh, yeah! Pulse width modulation is not limited to the square wave on this synthesizer. In fact, you can choose from any of the available waveforms and PWM yourself to oblivion. With the AX60, you get an onboard arpeggiator. and a split mode that lets you divide the synth anywhere you want on the keybed to play two patches at once, making it by timbrel. You can choose how many of the synth's six voices you want each side of the split to play, and you can route the arpeggiator and modulation wheels accordingly as well. Splitting the Juno 106's keybed is a little bit more of a process. An interesting trick the AX60 had up its sleeve was the ability to connect to a handful of Akai samplers, most notably the S612. This allowed you to play your samples and the synthesizer at the same time, blending between sound sources with this fader. You could use the AX60's analog chorus and filter to affect your samples, and you could employ the aforementioned split mode as desired here too. Unfortunately, when it comes to using this feature, you're just going to have to use your imagination because I don't have an Akai S612 sampler. I don't have an Akai S612 sampler. As far as the Akai AX60's quirks go, well, how about just existing for starters? Akai released the AX60 years after it was clear that the market was moving towards digital instruments. Not only was releasing an analog synthesizer covered in hands-on controls behind the times, the use of VCOs was also a curious choice, more akin to the synthesizers of the 70s than even the 80s. The AX60 also has a notoriously outrageous resonance. Yep, I'm outraged. Additionally, many of the sliders don't transition smoothly between values. Adjusting a parameter results in audible steps between settings, which makes sound design feel a little bit unpolished. 
A special feature unique to my AX60 is the fact that the previous owner stored it in their laundry room, so whenever I turn it on and it heats up, my studio smells like dryer sheets. As far as looks go, eh. The AX60 looks a little bit better in its dating profile than it does over dinner. The color scheme overall is a bit unpleasant, with the majority of it appearing black in photos, but actually being a strange, glittering brown. The sliders are all fax machine gray, some of the font is beige, other text is white, one of the two rows of buttons is blue out of nowhere, whatever. So while the AX60 does have an undeniably 80s look to it, it's not this 80s, it's this 80s. If we take a look at Akai Professional's output around this era, it reveals that they didn't really seem to know what they wanted their brand identity to be. Some of their stuff looks like Roland gear, the AX73 looks like it needs an ink cartridge, the S900 sampler looks like it'll call a nurse if your heart stops. This common photo of an AX60 shows a version of the keyboard with white text throughout, two rows of blue buttons, an envelope generator graph, and the slider banks all rearranged. What is going on here? So anyway, is the Akai AX60 worth picking up? If you're in the market for more of a budget-priced vintage analog polysynth, the AX60 is a pretty good choice. It has a great analog sound, and the split mode and sampler connectivity offer a lot of flexibility. It also doesn't suffer from voice chip or battery leak issues like the vintage options from Roland and Korg do. It looks, um... Well, looks aren't everything. Personally, I really enjoy the Akai AX80, and after having made this video and having my eyes opened a little bit more to the AX80 and the SX12 sampler, I just might have to tie up a couple financial loose ends. 